and good afternoon. So we're ready to start our uh, first keynote speech. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Natalie Skeed. Professor Skeed has been the Dean of the University of Western Australia Law School since 2017. She's a prolif prolific researcher and has published in fields of property, confiscation of proceeds of crime, equity and trusts, as well as in legal education and, and well-being in law. Professor Skeed is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, uh, chair of the Australian Law Academics Association, deputy chair of the Council of Australian Law Deans, associate editor of the Legal Education Review, and a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. In 2011, Professor Skeed received a national citation for her outstanding contribution to student learning. In 2017, she was the recipient of the Australian National Award for Teaching Excellence in Law. Professor Skeed has also been a great friend and supporter of our Directions and Legal Education Conferences. So she presented in the 2016 and 2018 conferences in the days when we could have face-to-face -face conferences and came over with a team from UWA. Now today, Professor Ski is going to talk about how we can support students in the transition from the law school to the workplace. If you've got any questions, then as before, please put them in the chat to me and I'll read them out to Professor Skeed at the end. So Professor Skeed's talk is entitled, Equipping Our, Our Law Students for Post-Law School Success. Over to you, Professor Skeed. Thank you so much, um, Professor Loa. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to you all, depending um, on where you are on the globe. Uh, I'm so delighted to be joining you um, this afternoon. It's a, it's a wet and chilly afternoon in Perth, so that um, my background picture is a bit misleading. Uh, although Perth does normally look like that, it certainly doesn't look like that today. I'm just going to share my screen with you. I'm not sure what you can see. We can see your slide saying, equipping our law, stu law student for post-law school success, but it's not yet in presentation mode. It's in, you know, we can see okay. the, we can Is see that the that's it. That's in presentation, oh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm so delighted to be joining you today. Um, I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. And I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which each of us is joining in this um, keynote address this afternoon. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Before I start, I'd really like to acknowledge that the past two and a half years have, um, I think it's fair to say, been nothing short of absolutely exhausting for the Legal Academy, um, higher education, certainly in Australia, but I suspect elsewhere, uh, and law schools within the academy um, have really gone through a period of, of great change, and, and I think that's fair to say disarray. Um, there have been significant academic structural changes in many uh, law schools, certainly in Australia, that have included um, redundancies really sadly. And so I think the academy finds itself in a really uh, precarious and, and uncertain position right at this moment. And so um, certainly as an administrator, but also as a law teacher and, and researcher, there's a bit, been a great deal, I think, to distract us from uh, our core purpose. And it's so in those circumstances that I'd like to extend my um, very grateful thanks to the Chinese University of Hong Kong for once again very generously hosting this fabulous conference. It's a conference that I think brings us together as an international academy, as a community to share in what 
what motivates us and what inspires us. And that is the pursuit of excellence in legal education and research. And so thank you to um, the law school at CUHK. Um, and I have such fond memories of being on your campus in 2017 and 2018. And I really hope that I'm able to be there again in 2024. Uh, I am nothing if not an optimist. Um, I have slipped a few slides, I'm afraid. Um, my presentation today is equipping our law students for post-law school success. And it, it seems to me in thinking about this, um, this address that legal education has been under review and under really close scrutiny, it seems, for decades. Um, and the common theme in legal education discourse continues, I think, to be dominated by calls for law schools to prepare students for what is, we're told, uh, an ever and very quickly evolving future in the profession or future in law to produce job ready graduates. So university um, education strategies are driven by an emphasis on employability. In fact, uh, in the 2020 Australian federal government um, higher education funding package, so the, the now previous Australian federal government released um, a, its new higher ed funding package, uh, which it called the Job Ready Graduates Package. It had the stated aim of investing in higher education in areas of national priority. Under this package, law was categorized in the funding ban that would suggest it's very, very low down on the list of national priorities. And, and I suppose in the midst of a, a global health crisis, that's not surprising. Uh, but what it does mean is that our students receive the lowest government contribution to their annual fees, uh, which in turn, of course, means that a law degree is now the most expensive or one of the most expensive degrees in the sector, together with, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, things like accounting, economics, commerce, um, etc. And so I think that puts on us as law schools uh, an even greater responsibility to ensure that our students are job ready, that they are employable post the law school studies, um, if only so that they can start earning enough money to pay um, the significant debt that they've incurred in order to, to graduate. But that really, um, begs the question, what, what does job ready mean in law? Does it mean something different from what it meant when I was at law school many, many years ago? Does it mean something different from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago? How is legal practice changing? And what, if anything, do law schools have to do in order to adapt to these changes? At the outset, I just want to be really clear as to what this um, presentation is not about. It's not about how we deliver legal education. So it's not about using technology in our teaching and assessing in law. It's not about the benefits of face-to-face -face versus online teaching. It's not about the future of the physical as opposed to the virtual campus. And, and I've, I note from the wonderful um, schedule of talks on um, the, in, the conf, in this conference that there are many who are addressing some of those topics and they are critical topics, but that's not um, the focus of, of my uh, presentation. At its core, it's about what law schools need to do to equip students for a future in the law, whatever that future might be. It's, about what academically, professionally, and personally transformational moments we can and should be providing our students while they're in our care, so as to ensure they can, that they can step confidently and competently 
into uh, their future, whatever that future might be. Um, as I've mentioned, there's for years now been an almost deafening rhetoric around the profession's expectations of law schools. And it goes something like the practice of law has changed or the practice of law is changing and therefore the teaching of law students must change too. But where is the evidence that law practice is changing or has changed? And precisely how has it changed or how is it changing? And precisely how should law schools be responding to this? Where is the empirical data to support these claims and demands? And so in an effort to really interrogate these questions and better understand what it is that we need to do as a law school in 2021 at UWA, um, I led an extensive external consultation process that was really part of, I, I guess, an internal review of our JD. So at UWA, we don't have an undergraduate law degree. Our law degree is the postgraduate Juris Doctor. And it's been in place for some time now, and it was an opportunity for us to, to really take a step back and ensure that the degree that we're offering students is meeting the needs of the broader profession. And that more um, importantly, that our students have what it is that employers are seeking. Uh, and so the results of this, so, so really we consulted with stakeholders being those who employ our students. Um, and the results of the consultation was really invaluable in gaining firsthand insight in, into precisely what it is that the profession requires and expects of law graduates. And so I wanted to share some of that with you today. The first, um, Firstly, the stakeholders that we consulted with, um, it was a broad ranging um, consultation process. And we consulted employers in the ratios uh, or in proportion to which they employ our graduates. So primarily large um, top tier firms, both Australian based and international, mid tier firms, small uh, suburban firms, as well as industry. Um, the judiciary and government. I should just say, um, acknowledge that it was a WA, a West Australian based um, consultation process. And so um, the views that we received may not be representative uh, nationally or internationally. Although I should say that um, most of our interviewees uh, do have national and international offices. Um, across the globe, so not just in the US and the UK. Our first area of interest was the core program. So legal knowledge, what is it that um, law students should know when they graduate? And, and um, from an Australian perspective, over the last few years, the target scope of the review of Australian legal education has been sharply focused on what we refer to as the priestly 11, which are our prescribed areas of knowledge. Uh, the, these priestlies are just one layer in a milfoy of regulation to which Australian um, law schools are subjected. It's ever increasing, unfortunately. Um, these are the 11 prescribed areas of knowledge. They were adopted 30 years ago. They have resulted in a very large core curriculum with very little wriggle room um, for options and electives. Despite, and I think it's fair to say there has been a tsunami of criticism leveled at this irreducible core of um, the law curriculum for at least two decades. Although they have gone through various iterations, they've mostly just been slightly tweaked, um, but left alone. This most significant change was to add a 12th area 
of um, knowledge being statutory interpretation. So although we now still fondly refer to these areas of knowledge as the priestly 11, there are in fact 12 areas of knowledge. And um, a comp we, had, we did undertake a comprehensive review of the priestly in 2019. Uh, there were some changes um, to both the substantive um, topics within these broader topics. Uh, and the scope was changed most commonly just to broaden them. Uh, but two and a half years on in 2022, those changes have still not been implemented. And so 30 years on, the priestly 11 remain the same. I have to confess though, that unlike many others, I'm pretty agnostic to these prescribed areas of knowledge. Um, many have criticized as early as 2000, um, the priestly 11 as being frozen in time uh, and the curriculum being anchored around outmoded and siloed notions of what lawyers need to know rather than what lawyers need to do, what lawyers need the professional uh, skills and values that lawyers need for contemporary legal practice. So that was as early as uh, 2000. Um, and in 2022, I can say that much of the criticism still relates to precisely those concerns. they persistent calls for the priestly to be significantly revised, even discarded in favor of variously described statements on skills or attributes, capabilities, uh, values, etc. And so given this real interest in um, and, and debate in legal knowledge, we were interested in ascertaining from um, employers what they considered to be uh, the critical areas of sub substantive law for law graduates. And so we asked them, we presented them with our core curriculum and asked them what the three most important areas were and what the three least important areas were. And um, the results are not surprising, particularly when you consider who we interviewed. Um, as a private law scholar, I can say I was very pleased <laughs> with the results. Um, I get to keep my job, uh, at least. Um, contract, corporations, law, equity and trusts were considered generally as being critical as well as other private law areas of torts and property. And I'm sure, Michael, that you're very pleased about that. Um, what I find pretty surprising um, is that there's no reference here to ethics. Um, or professional practice. I'll just leave that there. I'm going to very quickly slip through uh, or skip through the next slide um, because it is controversial um, and a lot of people have take issue with this, a lot of scholars. Uh, but again, I think it's important to, to bear in mind who we were speaking with. Um, and, and also to note that this was simply a ranking exercise. Uh, the general same sentiment was that all core units are important, that doctrinal knowledge and that understanding of fundamental legal principles and concepts is essential for any law graduate. And, and this aligns with other um, studies in this regard, including the New South Wales Law Society's Future of Law and Innovation in the Profession report, the FLIP report. Uh, we also asked, what units were not compulsory that employers thought should be compulsory and the results were terrifying. Um, the, the first one there I think reflects the um, very resource focused uh, or resource focus of the profession in Western Australia and the fact that Western Australia is a resource state. Um, the rest are place neutral and principally commercial in flavor. 
Uh, and I think it's important to note that despite what many may think, may say, or may wish, um, myself included, the stark reality is that the wider legal profession and those who are employing our graduates are servicing commercial clients, even the small firms. So this wasn't limited to the larger firms. Um, it extended to the um, smaller firms. And, and I think, again, despite what we may think, say, or wish, students are well aware of this. I, I um, and many of them have aspirations to practice uh, in, in the private sector, uh, in commercial law. I, I, we undertake a, a graduation, a gra graduate destination survey in our law school in October of every year. And in 2021, our graduating cohort of JD students, 74% of them had applied for jobs in private practice or in industry, 24% in government or the judiciary as judges associates, which left only 2% um, looking outside of um, private practice and, and a more commercial um, workplace. The message, I think, from the responses to this question is that if we're going to take the lead on the future of this, the law curriculum from the employers of our graduates, um, it will be a four or five year full-time degree comprising 28 perhaps prescribed areas of knowledge, all of them with a commercial focus. Uh, how utterly delightful I hear some of you thinking. The truth is that the Australian Academy, and I, I'm not sure whether this is the case elsewhere, but certainly in Australia, the Academy considers itself hamstrung by these areas of knowledge. The priestly dominate much of the discourse on and the frustration with the state of legal education in Australia. Um, there is a, a view that they are hampering our capacity to develop to develop in students the skills, the attributes, the capacities that they really do need for a successful career in law. I don't hold that view. Um, I think we make too much of the supposed constraints of the prescribed areas of knowledge. I think we can invert our approach to um, the core curriculum and rather perceiving of it as restrictions on how and what we teach. Um, it's more constructive, I think, to conceive of them as, a, as a, a known stable framework for developing our in our students those skills, those values, those attributes that they really do need to navigate successfully a world beyond law school. They provide a solid, stable scaffold around which we can shape the whole lawyer, the whole lawyer that the profession is really looking for, because the fact is that attributes and skills don't develop in a vacuum. So a student can have the most beautiful writing skills and write wonderful poetry, but without doctrinal knowledge, those skills are of little use in law. It's the knowledge that gives shape, that gives meaning, and that gives value to skills. And so if we view legal education and our curriculum through a skills, values, and attributes uh, lens, it really doesn't matter what 11 or 12 prescribed areas of knowledge there are. I mean, it could be any collection of unit. And so why not just keep the ones we have and work with them? But of course, that begs the question, what are the values? What are the skills? What are the attributes? Um, to be constructed around this doctrinal uh, rules-based framework. So we asked employers, what are the skills that you're looking for in law graduates? And I've just listed in this table, excuse me, um, the most common. Most of these are not surprising. Most of them are embedded through the typical law degree, wherever it may be. They reflect what uh, some have described as the timeless qualities that are required of law graduates. Um, 
and there we have substantive knowledge being critical. So the core uh, of a law degree serves a very important purpose, and that is developing su substantive knowledge and understanding of legal principles and concepts. What was surprising to us um, and something that we as a law school had not previously turned our minds to, although I'm getting a sense from some of the presentations I've, I've been in today that other schools may be more advanced on this, was this idea of commerciality. Um, that typically that's not something we focus on in law schools. We are, and by, by commerciality, I'm not referring to commercial law, but it's that understanding of the commercial context in which clients operate. Um, this was not just a common theme in the larger commercial law, law firms, it was across the board. Um, that's understanding um, clients' business contexts. Closely aligned with this was another skill that featured strongly and that, that I actually have um, been thinking about more in recent times, and that is the feedback we got was that graduate law graduates tend to be really skilled in dispute resolution, so problem solving in law. What they're not good at is an understanding of transactional law, so being able to work with contracts, for example, understanding transactions, interpreting transactions. Looking at all of these skills, um, all eight of them, I'd suggest that they can all be, and in fact are probably best developed within our core framework. What better place is there to teach um, drafting or the understanding of transactional law than contract? or even property. The perfect place for commerciality is company law. Um, what was surprising from this list was there was no mention of tech skills. And, and we've heard already um, today, and, and certainly in the stream that I was intending, a great deal about technology in law. Um, and there seems to be a never ending stream of commentary that technology and automation and I, AI uh, are making much of the people work in law obsolete. And that as, as law schools, we need to respond to ensure that we're preparing our students for a markedly different career in an automated legal workplace. Personally, I have to say, I find the prospect of automation in law and the idea of AI undertaking lawyery work or lawyers work, including negotiation, um, the mediation and determination of disputes, um, pretty terrifying for reasons visualized. Um, We know that there have been huge strides in technology over the past 40 years, even longer. Commentary and scholarship abounds with claims that as a result of advances in technology, automation, AI, people work is doomed. We face a jobless future. AI is livelihood devouring. Work has outlived its usefulness. <laughs> Some might be delighted at that prospect. Um, I'm certainly not. Uh, these, but these predictions um, that technology is taking over jobs, taking over people work are um, by no means new. Importantly though, there is also a vast body of literature that points to the tendency to overestimate the rate of automation. Uh, and its impact on work. For instance, the reality is more complex and interesting than the headlines. There is no radical transformation underway in the Australian labour market. As routine jobs dwindle, as machines replace more menial repetitive work, 
other jobs are likely to flourish. And my first personal favorite, I'm Astra Taylor, the myth of human obsolescence. Automated processes are often far less impressive than the puffery and propaganda surrounding them. But what about automation in law? Those are references to automation in the workplace more generally. What about in law? We're all familiar with them. There's already been a reference, at least one reference today to Suskin's work and his prediction in 2008 that the jobs for which law schools are training or educating our students will no longer exist or will cease to exist, that legal services will become high volume, low employment services, relying on AI with a diminishing need for lawyers. 14 years on, I think we can say that that has certainly proven not to be the case, or at least not yet. Um, in Australia, the legal sector at present is employing more junior lawyers and more uh, law graduates than ever before. The number of lawyers in a report, a New South Wales report from 2021, the number of lawyers in New South Wales, working lawyers in New South Wales, increased to uh, increased by 45% from 2013 to 2020. It is true, though, that lawyers are operating in increasingly tech-enabled workplaces. Many, many firms, though, it's, technology is not stealthily creeping up behind law firms um, and taking them by surprise. Law firms are engaging with transformative technologies. They have uh, innovation mindsets. They have uh, well-developed, detailed innovation strategies. Um, they're meeting the tech challenge head on. That doesn't mean, though, that human lawyers are becoming obsolete in the delivery of services. Far from it. Rather, I think what we're seeing is that technology is providing the tools that are empowering human lawyers to deliver more efficient, cost-effective, and better services. Automated tools are increasingly undertaking those basic menial tasks of discovery, billing, document review, due diligence, all those things that as a junior lawyer in the 1990s, um, I cut my teeth on, and I think, thank God, they are now being done by machines. Um, crucially, though, and Lisa Tui in her presentation earlier today referred to this as the, the good news story of tech, technology is also opening up access to legal services. But technology is not delivering services and providing access to services to the exclusion of human lawyers. And to think that it is, is risky, or oh, I apologize for that. Um, as Frank Pasquale has noted, the assumption that legal work is predictable, that it's capable of being learned by machines with access to enough data is the recipe for trapping the law and those who access it in the past. So while yes, some legal work has and will continue to be automated, you cannot automate what is fundamentally human. And it's in this context, uh, a context in which continued technological advancement in the legal profession is inevitable, uh, and a context in which it will continue to support the improvement in the delivery of legal services and access to legal services. It was surprising for us that lawyers or employers of our law graduates rather, do not appear to expect law graduates to have any tech skills or certainly not any advanced tech skills. And, and this result 
is consistent with the 2019 Law Society of England and Wales report, uh, in which it was reported that the solicitors surveyed um, in that study considered that advanced or specialized IT skills were the least important day-to-day -day skills for a lawyer. In our meetings with our stakeholders, we sought to probe this issue just a little further. And so we asked a very targeted question. We asked how their legal practice had changed in the last five years. Um, and then specifically, we were interested in whether it was their perception that our law school had responded adequately to those changes. And the responses were somewhat surprising. Almost a quarter said that nothing has changed in five years. Um, I suspect that's not the case. I, I suspect that change has been gradual and in the normal course of change, so nothing notable. Um, what was surprising and really disappointing, frankly, was that only just after uh, over a quarter said that there had been changes in workplace culture. Recent reports on sexual harassment and bullying in the legal workplace are nothing short of shameful. Um, and it seems to me a real pity that only a quarter of the profession seems to be taking positive action to address that. Um, the two most common responses to changes were firstly the way in which information is presented to clients so very common experience was that clients are no longer prepared to wade through a 10-page uh, memorandum of advice clients want short sharp clear concise advice preferably on a single page or uh, graphically presented in a single powerpoint for instance um, and I think the good news for law school theory is this is really easy to implement in our um, curriculum, um, certainly in our, in our assessments. And, and the very good news in that is who wouldn't rather mark a single page um, memorandum than a 10 page assignment. Uh, more significantly, and not surprisingly, there was a recognition um, that technology had uh, impacted on the more menial high volume tasks, the ones I've mentioned already, document review, discovery, conveyancing, etc. Those tasks that had previously been undertaken by junior lawyers, but the message was that this hasn't resulted in less work for junior lawyers, rather different work. Um, work that included, for example, reviewing the outcome of automated processes, but um, there was a sense that there are now these flatter teams. So instead of work spreading horizontal, sorry, uh, vertically, work is now spending uh, is now spreading horizontally, and as a result of more is being expected of junior lawyers, uh, they simply need to know more and be able to do more. We specifically asked the question um, whether law schools need to do anything to respond to these technological changes. And it was a resounding no as the response. Um, there is little point, many said, in trying to ensure students understand or are familiar with spe specific technologies because they are changing so quickly. But more fundamentally, the view was that law graduates are inherently digitally literate. But if they're not, they learn very quickly on the job. And, and I have to say that is our experience at UWA. We have a, a digital design unit, Legal Aptitude. Students pick up the coding uh, and the app building skills in no time and with no effort whatsoever. What really challenges them is the 
client management as well as the project management. So I think uh, on technology, um, ultimately, the, prof the profession was certainly clear with us that they're not looking for technological wizards or gurus. What they're looking for are those things that make us human. They're looking for those attributes, those values, those skills that give us the competitive edge over automated systems. But what are they? What are the attributes um, that make us singularly human? I've separated them into professional attributes, those professional intangibles and personal intangibles. And what was really interesting is that um, employers seem to value the personal intangibles over the professional attributes other than um, intelligence, perhaps not surprisingly. We know that the workplaces into which our graduates are going to be stepping when they leave us are really high pressure. They're very demanding. They're client focused, they're competitive. Um, and so in order to function confidently and competently in these new environments, uh, environments, our graduates, they need interpersonal skills. They need to be able to build and maintain relationships, not just with clients, but with colleagues. They need to be culturally competent. They need to be able to work across diverse global cultural contexts. They need to be resilient. They need to be able to persevere when things get tough. And for all of us who have worked in a, in a law firm previously, they certainly know that need to be able to take criticism. These are high expectations. Um, and we know that many of our law students face challenges, challenges that are not dissipating. Um, I know that Nigel tomorrow will be addressing issues of well-being in the profession, um, and I'm very much looking forward to his wisdom. But we know that mental health challenges don't start after law school. Law students. Uh, experience higher levels of psychological distress than others, uh, general population of the same demographic, as well as others, uh, other university students in different disciplines. And we also know that the decline in mental health typically begins from their first semester in law school. In 20 17, I uh, led a Australia-wide study of both law students and um, those in the profession. And the results were just startling. Um, compared to 13% of the general population experiencing severe to extremely severe psychological distress, more than double. 31 law students across Australia are experiencing severe to extremely severe psychological distress. And of course, there are um, the usual limitations with, with empirical studies that are dependent on surveys. Um, but even if those figures are slightly exaggerated, they are still alarming. Since 2017, um, and particularly in the past two years, our students, uh, as with all young people, have been dealing with a loss of identity, a loss of place, a loss of relationships, many of them with deep-seated loneliness. The uncertainty of the future is calling, causing a great deal of anxiety. And so one might reasonably expect that the rates reported here have, in fact, only increased since this study. The potential causes of 
high incidence of psychological distress amongst law students are many and varied, and of course they are likely to be cumulative. Um, they fit really neatly into the into the three basic needs for human flourishing that has been posited by the self-determination theory. The needs of autonomy, competence, relatedness. Autonomy being, autonomy being a sense of choice and volition in the regulation of behavior, a sense of efficacy one has with respect to both internal and external environments. Relatedness, that feeling of being connected to and cared for by others, belonging, a sense of belonging. So we can see finances, heavy workload, teaching methods and curriculum relate to that absence of autonomy. Perfectionism, which we've also heard about um, today, lack of feedback, pessimism, relate to that the absence of a sense of competence and lack of connectedness, the innately adversarial nature of law and the competitiveness of law schools um, affect a student's sense of belonging to a community. These are all needs that I think we can at least begin to meet, perhaps not address entirely, but at least begin to address through really careful and thoughtful student-focused pedagogy and assessment and creating for our students an, an inclusive, a safe and a supportive learning, learning environment. So where does all of this leave us? All of the information, the insights that we gathered from speaking with those who employ our graduates about what it is that they're looking for in graduates, what they're expecting from graduates. Um, the reality is, uh, and I'm not going to sugarcate this, it leaves us with a great deal of very important work to do in our law schools. But also, I'd suggest with immensely satisfying and rewarding work to do. To adapt the thesis of Carl, Lod Carl Rogers from his person centered actualization theory. As law schools, we should provide an environment that allows students to move away from what they are not, what they are pretending to be to stop trying to be more than they are with the attendant feelings of insecurity and failure, to stop trying to be less than they are with attendant feelings of guilt or embarrassment, to be fulfilling their true or that self which they most truly are, that human self which they most truly are, and allowing their fellow students and others to do the same there was um, a recent, and I'd suggest wildly misdirected article by Stephanie Costi in the Australian Lawyers Weekly. Um, and Costi laid a significant portion of the blame for the bullying and the harassment that's pervading the legal profession squarely at the feet of law schools. And um, I take issue with so much of what was in the article, but what I do agree with is Costi's challenge to law schools. She challenged law schools to help build students up to be empowered, ethically minded and good hearted graduates who can help make the world better. It's a big task, there's no doubt it's a big task. What there's also no doubt about is that we don't all have to do it in the same way. Um, we don't have to pick up the challenge um, and head in the same direction. Some law schools are variously weaving sustainability, digitization, globalization or internationalization, work integrated learning through their curriculum. And they're all fantastic initiatives and important um, programs that hold um, a curriculum 
together. At our law school, um, at UWA, we are seeking to achieve or to, <clears throat> to take up this challenge rather, excuse me for a moment, through our um, comprehensive indigenization of the JD program, where we are deliberately and, and ever so carefully embedding in a scaffolded way, indigenous knowledges, perspectives, um, experiences into the core program of this Juris Doctor. And I have to say um, that this process and this program is really transforming the lens through which both staff and students think about the law, but also uh, how they place themselves within the law. Um, it is, I think, um, putting students in a position where they are better able to contribute to shaping the better future um, of which Costi, um, or to which Costi refers. Uh, whatever future that, or whatever form that future may take. It's a future in which they can step more confidently and more competently. And so in closing, um, and in keeping with my own law school's approach to equipping students for life after law school, I'd like to read a piece entitled Futures from my extraordinary colleague and friend, Amberlyn Quaymulliner's um, remarkable, remarkable and really powerful manifesto, Living on St Stolen Land. Amberlyn writes, the places where different worlds meet can be places of connection, enrichment, and transformation. What is to come, all the things that are next, lives within the hearts and minds, hopes of Indigenous peoples and of settlers who are committed to do justice. Decolonized futures are what we create together. And so my wish for all of us is that those places of connection, of enrichment, of transformation are our law students and that we are able to equip our students to help create those fabulous futures. Uh, and I will just say, as a final word, I just don't think we can do this on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, so, well, that, that, that was a wonderful presentation. And, and I've got two pages worth of questions. So we've only, we've only got seven minutes. So- I'm Sorry about that. No, no, that's fantastic. Um, but before I, can I just say though, that um, if you've got any, questions for Natalie, could you please uh, put them in the chat and uh, to me, and then I'll, and then I'll pose them. But it, until I see, until I see any, I, I'm going to start, if you don't mind, on my long list of questions. Uh, well, actually, first of all, uh, with a, a comment at the beginning of your talk, just to say how, how, how pleased I was to, to hear you talk about the idea of this conference as a, a kind of a platform for an international community of legal, legal educators, because that is in exactly what it's intended to be. And also, hopefully, I think what, what I hope we can do is to tie in with other uh, such platforms. I want to go uh, just, uh, well, let me just see which of these shall I go for. Yes, on the priestly 11. And um, do you think that one of the, I think my feeling from what you said is that nobody really, well, legal academics have got an issue with the Priestly 11, but law, law firm, firms don't, and you don't. Um, yes, I think it's fair to say that law firms certainly don't. Uh, and in fact, as we saw, they'd like to expand them to include a whole host of other 
um, commercially focused uh, compulsory units. Um, I, I would, uh, I'm agnostic, Michael, as, as I mentioned. I, I, skills, the, the development of skills, of attributes, of values is really critical in our students, but you can't do that in a knowledge void. Yeah. They have to be wrapped around um, a, a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And why not those areas of knowledge that employers are telling us are important to them? So I think we can get really wrapped up in, in feeling constrained by this prescription and regulation of, of what we have to teach. But actually, there are ways of teaching uh, that content that can achieve other really important uh, objectives. Yes, thanks, Nat uh, thanks, Natalie. Steve Gallagher asks whether you could talk a bit more about the concept of commerciality. Yes. Uh, he says he believes this is a similar concept, concept to that identified as missing from Hong Kong law students by law firms. And Steve refers to a study done by our colleague, Paul Mitchard, who did something similar to you, a bit similar, when to speak to law firms to ask what he thought that our graduates lacked when they made applications and, 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 and yep. hit the workplace. So commerciality. It was a really strong theme. And, and what surprised me was it was also a theme that came out in the in our consultation with um, the small suburban firm that clients are operating within a, a commercial context and students don't understand that context that they need students who, who, who apply for jobs at commercial law firms need to demonstrate that actually they have an interest in in um, commercial matters and so things uh, things that were being said were things like you know students should be reading the financial review on a daily basis they need to be aware of what's going on around them in the business world so that's not necessarily something that we can teach but what we can do is we can pass that message on to our students thanks natalie a um, uh, question from Anne hewitt is the desire for firms to add to the P11 list of subjects part of an ongoing trend of moving the cost of training from the employer to the employee? This is consistent with the decline of articles and replacement with GDLP in Australia. Uh, hello, Anne, <laughs> um, my dear friend, Anne. Uh, and I think a really good question, but not one that I, that I uh, think the answer to is yes. Frankly, I think um, employers understand that they do not recruit fully fully formed lawyers when they recruit law graduates. And in fact, there, there were some firms which, which um, interestingly, don't even take, don't even recruit law graduates. They wait for other firms to invest the time and money in, in building their skills and then recruit um, horizontally, sideways. Um, but I didn't get the sense that there is an expectation that we produce um, these fully formed lawyers by, by any stretch, um, that law firms understand that, that they have an obligation to train um, their, their graduates. But, but what there is a recognition of is because there are, there's no longer the menial work for, you know, that we cut our teeth on thousand page discoveries that we numbered by hand. Um, uh, law graduates don't do that anymore. Um, so they are having to right off the bat undertake uh, more sophisticated and difficult work, um, which in, in a sense, I guess, does put the burden on law schools to ensure that they're e equipped for that. But I'm not sure that there's necessarily an unburdening of the responsibility um, down the line. Thank you. Now, Natalie, can I come in with another question? And that is your suggestion that things like drafting skills could be built into the kind of the, you know, teaching the, the core pre-C11. Yeah. What strikes me about that is 
of course, it's a lovely idea, but it's going to come at a cost, isn't it? You know, to to draw up because it'd be more. I just think you'd need to have you know the well, it would be costly to prepare documents and uh, you know to create materials that that would do that job. What do you think? Can you easily or well, I, I think we. Uh... I think we need to be more uh, innovative in our assessments, Michael. Um, and I think that's that's um, quite possible in in land law, for instance. Um, to speak to, to you directly, to your heart directly. Uh, we have a workshop where students actually uh, use the e-conveyancing platform to prepare um, a a caveat and a withdrawal of caveat. And in the course of an hour and a half, they really get familiar with that platform. But in the same pro in, at the same time, they're also learning the substantive content on caveats, the purpose um, and, and the underpinning principles. So, so I, think, I think we can do it, um, but, probably, but it does need some creative thinking around how we embed um, content into these more practical skills. Um, we, we've just introduced, you know, actually completely off the back of this consultation process, we've introduced, we've replaced one core unit with another called interpretation. And that's the, and it's not just statutory interpretation, which is required under the priestly, but it's interpretation of um, different legal instruments, including contracts. So that will give students an opportunity to really work with con work with contracts and develop their transactional um, understanding. Um, Natalie, one another question has come in, but we've only got a minute. So <laughs> I'll read it to you. It's from Jessica Kutin at Victoria Law Foundation. At UWA, UWA, how do students get exposed to other areas of law, such as community, community lawyering, human rights, social justice? And the option of working in your organisations that address issues of access to justice. Um, really good question. Um, we have a legal internship unit uh, where students are placed in a workplace of their, uh, and when students apply for um, their particular workplace, they indicate their area of of preference. And it's there where we find a lot of students um, preferencing uh, community legal centres, um, government departments, so, so they do get to have that experience um, of working in a non-commercial workplace. Of course, we also have um, human rights units, we have international human rights, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, public international law. So, so very much um, social justice uh, and um, internationally focused units. Um, and our criminal law unit, which is compulsory, is the, the, the locus of um, really important work on justice uh, and miscarriages of justice. So, so there are opportunities throughout the curriculum uh, including the core curriculum to insert uh, social justice and, and non-commercial areas of, of law. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Professor Nigel Duncan uh, commented that he would endorse your suggestion um, uh, 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 and uh, they adopt a similar approach on, on the, the bar course at City. Uh, not, perhaps we can come back to that later because I'm not quite sure which suggestion it is that Nigel's endorsing. But let me just say that Professor Nigel Duncan is speaking this evening at 6.30. There's an overlap with you because he's talking about resilience and that might be an opportunity just to clarify that as well. So many thanks Natalie for that wonderful presentation, the lively Q&A afterwards. And now we must go to our groups because at five, five, 10 past five Hong Kong time, in two minutes, we start the new groups. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael. Thank you everyone.